Hi, my name is Divya, and today I'm here to talk about our work on learning to limit data collection via scaling laws, in which we offer a computational interpretation of the legal principle of data minimization. This work is joint with all the people on the slide. From left to right, it's me, Samira, Fernando, Michelle, and Asha. The reigning attitude towards data sets is the bigger, the better. And this has meant that data collection and machine learning is often unrestricted, where companies aggressively collect personal data in pursuit of profits. This neglects the real and tangible concerns of data over collection, including privacy, liability, and storage. So let's say we're building a birth control pill recommendation system. What a company might do is collect every feature all of it from each of its examples or users and store this information forever in the hopes that it might be useful to some predictive task they think of in the future. This is obviously problematic because these features are sensitive and often concern things like user pregnancies or menstrual cycle symptoms. And even in recent months, we've seen the dangers of sharing that type of data with companies who can then sell it to others. What the GDPR imagines and also requires is that companies collect relevant features, an adequate number of examples, and that data collection and storage must be limited. Each of these ideas is encoded in the legal principle of data minimization, which is a part of the GDPR. Despite the fact that it was instantiated in 2016, it has it's faced little adoption due to a lack of technical guidelines and computational interpretations. This leads us to the central question in this work. How do we formalize limited data collection? Our answer is a framework that we call FIDO, um, which stands for a framework for inhibiting data over collection. And the key idea here is that we learn a model's performance curve as data is collected to enforce a stopping criteria. This framework builds on two areas of research, those being data minimization and performance curves. In terms of data minimization, we build on an interpretation that ties data collection purpose to system performance. On top of that, existing work makes a distinction between breadth-based and depth-based data minimization, where breadth-based data minimization concerns the limited collection of features or columns in the data, and depth-based data minimization concerns the limited quantity of feature values or entries in a matrix. Examples of breadth-based data minimization include some approaches over the last few years that rely on things like feature imputation to decide which features are necessary and which features aren't. Our work tackles depth-based data minimization in recommendation systems. In terms of performance curves, people have been doing this for a really long time and studying the relationship between data set size and uncertainty estimates and performance. On top of that, scaling laws have and their ability to predict gains in deep learning have received a lot of attention in the last few years. What our work does is ask, can we exploit these learnable relationships to limit data collection rather than justify it? And specifically, can we use the stages of data collection to produce an ac ac accurate stopping criteria? So this happens in three steps, where the first is to collect data, the second is to fit a performance curve, and the third is to evaluate a stopping criteria. In the first step, we assume that a data processor collects Q feature values using a feature acquisition algorithm H. And note that this is flexible to any type of feature acquisition algorithm, including active feature acquisition. To talk a little bit more about the second step of fitting the performance curve, we do this by using the acquired data A and a pre-specified performance metric sigma. What we do is subsample the acquired data to different sizes, evaluate the performance of a trained model, on each subsample on a validation set V, and then use these sample size performance pairs to fit a performance curve. In particular, we model the performance curve in a specific way in which we model different stages of the data collection process with individual power law curves. This is distinct from prior work, which typically models the whole performance curve with one power law. In the final step, we evaluate the stopping criteria. So this could be any data minimization objective defined using the performance curve. And in the main, main text of our paper, we use a returns-based criteria. And so we use the estimated performance curve to seize data collection when the derivative of the performance curve falls below some threshold on the return given additional data. There's a lot in this paper. Um, the task that we focus on is recommendation, and we look at multiple data sets, feature acquisition algorithms, performance curve families, and data minimization objectives, in addition to even more. So if this is something that's interesting to you, I recommend you check out the paper. 
So I just want to highlight a few results that I think are particularly interesting. And the first is that common performance curve families systematically overestimate the return on additional data. So what I mean to say here is that using these traditional approaches of one power law for the entirety of data collection can lead to these systematically incorrect estimates. So here what I plotted is an illustration of these three stages, where on the x-axis there's the training data set size, and on the y-axis is generalization error, so lower is better. So typically what people will do is fit one power law for the entirety of data collection, and this will describe the middle region quite well, but what happens when you use this estimate to extrapolate into the diminishing returns region is you underestimate generalization error given additional data, or you overestimate the return on that data. And what we see is that our empirical experiments validate this behavior. So here what I'm showing you is a similar graph where on the x-axis is the percent of available data, and the y-axis is the slope or the return in mean squared error. What you can see is that some of these curves lie below the true red line for the entirety of data collection, including some of these popular two-parameter and three-parameter power laws. Following directly from this, what we find is that modeling each stage of data collection separately produces the most accurate stopping criteria, which is often as accurate as an oracle, which has access to the full data set and can identify the correct stopping point retrospectively. So here what I'm showing is a table with a ton of results, um, but on the far left is just the different data sets that we test. We also test across mul multiple thresholds, and what you can see is that the estimates that FIDO produce, where these numbers represent the percentage of data collected for a specific threshold, are extremely close to those produced by the Oracle. We also find that active feature acquisition leads to noisier stopping criteria and can lead to data collection concentrated in a small number of users. So on the left, we see that the error bars are much higher when you use one of these AFA algorithms. And on the right, what you see on the x-axis is the number of features collected, and on the y-axis is the number of users. And you see that this graph is, is severely skewed, where a small, um, a small percentage of users bear the majority of the feature collection burden. And finally, we find that user-specific performance curves don't always improve with more data. In our experiments, approximately 20% of users experience degraded model performance with the collection of additional data. And this suggests that monotonic curve models are not the right choice for modeling these user-specific performance curves. Results from our experiments highlight five important considerations when designing a data minimization pipeline. The first is to choose a feature acquisition algorithm wisely. Our experiments show that while active feature acquisition might seem natural, it provides noisier performance curves and disparate data collection across users. Second consideration is to choose a performance curve widely because your performance curve model choice will dictate how aggressively you ultimately collect data because certain performance curves will overshoot the correct stopping criterion while others will underestimate it. So it may not be that you, you always want the performance curve model that is the most accurate. You may want something that's more aggressive or less aggressive. It's also important to create a representative validation set, and I mean this in two ways, representative in terms of uh, representation across groups, but also representation in terms of um, the model's performance on unseen data. Without a representative validation set, it may be necessary to bootstrap estimates, maybe training the model on multiple samples of a specific size instead of just one. Identifying a relevant objective is also something that should happen at the beginning. And in our paper, we consider two different performance curve-based objectives, but many more are possible and would be dictated by domain expertise. And finally, it's important to perform user-specific impact analyses to ensure that data minimization isn't disproportionately affecting performance for certain subgroups. In sum, our experiments reveal guidelines for design choices across the data minimization pipeline and future directions for operationalizing data minimization. If you'd like to chat, visit our poster, email me, or talk to us in person. Thank you for listening.